Good afternoon, Northwest sports fans. This is Nick Sisson on behalf of Z Bookies uh, Sports Betting Podcast, um, produced by N2 Media. Um, coming at you here today, um, it's the 22nd of December, and that means the start of the NBA season is finally here, and there's going to be some excitement this year, uh, especially around um, Kevin Durant, uh, Kyrie Irving playing together in Brooklyn. Um, I think that the question going into this season is going to be, is there a team that realistically is going to contend with the Lakers? We'll get to that a little bit more um, later on. Uh, Beings that we feature uh, most of our stuff around the Northwest here, um, the Portland Trailblazers come in this season um, a little bit different looking uh, than they did last season, a little bit overhaul um, in the small forward front court position uh, to try to supplement you know, the inability to play any defense essentially last year uh, when matched up against uh, any good small forward in the league, especially in the playoffs, that was exposed against LeBron James and Anthony Davis. I mean, Yusuf Nurkic um, was of little to no help, actually. Uh, so you can put to bed, you know, the whole theory that that three seed that made it to the Western Conference Finals with the, oh, if they would have had Nurkic, if they would have had him, they probably would have made it. I, uh, I'm not so sure if Yusuf Nurkic is necessarily the guy that is going to get you to the next level when it comes to being a big man in the league. I mean, he's clearly getting owned by Anthony Davis in every single matchup that they have. Um, JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard even made him look pretty average at times, which is scary considering that, you know, the Blazers have pretty much bet on Nurkic. They let Whiteside go. Um, they take in a young uh, project in Harry Giles III uh, from uh, Sacramento, who does have some upside at the position, maybe with some grooming um, he did have a pedigree playing at Duke, so we'll see how that goes. Um, more or less, though, the eye test for, for what I've seen in preseason isn't good. Um, the defense has been non-existence. They've had back-to-back -back blowout losses to the Nuggets. Um, the Western Conference, top to bottom, is as scary as it has ever been. There are a lot of teams with a lot of talent. So far, the Blazers look like they're cracking the top 10 on ESPN's preseason power rankings. Um, they're just outside uh, the top 10 on NBC.com's uh, power rankings. Um, looking where they have them at, they have them at 12. You know, with the additions of Derek Jones Jr. from Miami, you know, I get it. He's a slam dunk champion. He can add some excitement, and he's going to play some defense as well. He prides himself on trying to lock up the, the best defender on the court. You're still going to need to generate, you know, some offense somehow. And, you know, you can't really rely on Lillard and McCollum to continuously shoulder the load. Um, so they also go out and get Robert Covington, who's, you know, the corner three guy, also um, a guy they're hoping to rely upon to improve upon their defense. And they're relying on Zach Collins coming back. And, you know, the eye test so far is Zach Collins, um, even when healthy, isn't going to develop into a bona fide, you know, top 10 talent of which, you know, he was drafted to be. So all in all, the Blazers are 12th on the power rankings coming in. I personally see them finishing about third uh, in the Northwest Division, I've got the Denver Nuggets uh, finishing first and winning the division. And the Utah Jazz coming in at second. Uh, and then the Blazers at third, uh, the Thunder at fourth, and the T-Wolves at fifth. Um, ultimately, you always want to question what the Blazers are going to do if you're a fan in terms of generate a contender. If you really look up and down in the West, the Lakers are, are clearly the number one team. I mean, the next closest team to them is probably the other team that plays in LA and the Clippers. Um, and even they probably don't even have enough firepower, firepower excuse me, to even contend with them realistically. The only thing in in my opinion, that contends with the Lakers not winning the championship is the Lakers and, and injuries. If that's the only thing that can possibly derail this train. Um, they go out and they add uh, Montrez Harrell. I mean, they steal the sixth man of the year, essentially, uh, from the team who plays in the same building who wants to contend with you. And then you also go out and get Dennis Schroeder. I mean, they've got some guys that can come out and, and help supplement the nights where LeBron might want to rest his legs a little bit and not carry and shoulder the load. I mean, Anthony Davis is still clearly their their best player. No slide on LeBron. I won't say clearly. He's. I think that Davis is their best player. He's the best talent overall. But um, at this point in his career, LeBron has all the pieces around him to win another chip. Um, again, it's going to add to the the question. You know, what will his legacy ultimately be? Will he be remembered uh, as the greatest of all time? More to that to come. Back to the Blazers real quick here. 
if you're Neil Olshay, what do you do to try to improve your team it, going forward this season? My guess is, is that without Collins in the lineup early on, they're going to struggle defensively. And with their new pieces coming in and with Rodney Hood coming back, um, you know, it might take a little bit of time to get everybody to gel. Here's what I'm super excited about if I'm a Blazers fan. I'm super excited about Gary Trent Jr. I'm super excited about C.J. Ellerby. I mean, you want to talk about a guy who is born in the Northwest, played his ball in Seattle. Um, a dream come true for him, um, according to the reports, that he wants to play um, in the Northwest so he can try to spotlight his talent. And I believe that he adds... Um, a different type of dynamic when I watch some of the way he plays I kind of compare it to Tayshaun Prince um, in terms of his overall length and athleticism it doesn't look as conventional um, and his shot doesn't look quite as conventional as you might expect but he's got um, a, a lot of things going for him and a lot of upside I think that was a steal uh, in the second round so I'm excited about a couple of young guys that the Blazers have on the roster. Trent is an interesting guy because he can bring back that ability to, to maybe parlay a trade. You know, the thing is, is that I feel ultimately going forward that Nurkic isn't necessarily the problem, although it'd be nice to have a better big than him. I think ultimately you have to look at McCollum and Lillard's relationship. And this is no slide on CJ McCollum at all. The guy's a borderline superstar. I mean, he finished the Denver Nuggets in game seven when Lillard was not having the best series after he sent, you know, Oklahoma City home packing. Um, I just ultimately feel like that McCollum and him paired together uh, might not be the championship combination. I would rather see Lillard paired, you know, with a bigger guard who can also play on the ball, uh, you know, similar to McCollum, and where Lillard can potentially work off the ball a little bit more. Um, because Lillard is just the deadliest catch-and-shoot guy in the league. He's the deadliest walk-up-and-dribble-past-half-court-and-shoot guy in the league. I mean, other than Steph Curry, there's no other person on the planet besides him. Maybe the, the Trey Young is, you know, borderline getting to the point to where he can walk up confidently from 35 feet, just trot it up and jack it up and drain him. But Lillard and Steph Curry are definitely on that level consistent, consistently. I would, if I'm the Blazers... I don't know how the fan base would feel about it. Feel free to leave your comments in the bottom. But what about James Harden? What about trying to trade C.J. McCollum and another young guy who you might not want to give away? you got Anthony Simons in the backcourt and you got Gary Trent in the backcourt. Both of them are young. They kind of play the same position. You're going to need one of them, you know, to bona fide come off the bench. I, I'd like to keep Trent if I could. I'd be willing to part way with Simons, obviously, at this point. Um, but he's an up-and-coming, developing young guy as well. Um, I like the moves that the Blazers did to the front court to try, to try to solidify their defense because, again, that's the area where they've been severely lacking is being able to guard the guy on the three, the guy on the four. Um, but I think that if they can make a move like that to get Harden in there, that puts them in a different position, puts them over the top. Would the, would the cohesiveness be there? Would they gel with Harden and Lillard? I mean, Harden commands a lot of shots, but the one thing that I like about James Harden's game is James Harden gets to the free throw line. Whether you like it or not, whether you think he flops, whether you think he draws excessive contact somehow, um, he gets a lot of whistles. Um, he's about 15 to 16 free throws a game usually. And if you think about it, you know, what better way to generate points when you can't generate a ton down low is to try to get the ball to a guy who can draw a foul and get to the line and potentially win it there. Um, I'm not saying that that's a strategy that you want to bank your whole season on is to try to draw a foul and get there. But James Harden is also a guy who can create off the dribble. I mean, he gets at least two and a half or three steps every time he gets a possession. I think that if you're the Blazers, you might explore this option because Houston, from the sounds of it, they want to give him away for a bag of balls. And I'm not saying that CJ McCollum is a bag of balls. He's certainly not. But is he on an MVP level like James Harden is? No. No. If you can get James Harden somehow as a shooting guard this season um, in a trade package, I would strongly urge the Blazers to look at it, considering the options of this. Where are you realistically going to go after this season? If after this season you put together a similar package like you've done the last three or four with Lillard and McCollum, ever since Aldridge pretty much has left town, you're relying on the Steph Curry guard play. You looked at Golden State and you said, this is the team that we need to be more like because they're going to own the Western Conference. Well, you didn't count on LeBron James and Anthony Davis pairing up and coming out and dominating the Western Conference either. 
So now the focus is a little bit, you know, more balanced. It's back to basketball. It's not back to you just got to match a bunch of guard play and jack up a bunch of threes to try to match them in transition. You know, that's why the Houston Rockets didn't work. That's why Mike D'Antoni's out of a job. That's why Daryl Morey's a GM someplace else, and he's going to go try to turn Philly into the exact same thing. There's no way he's going to keep Ben Simmons past game, I don't know, 30, because Ben Simmons doesn't shoot threes, and that's all Daryl Morey wants you guys to do. Anyway, that's kind of uh, where I'm at with the Blazers going forward this season. I mean, my ceiling for them in the Western Conference is probably a seventh seed. Um, and even then, your your match, you, you got a chance in the, to get past the first round. But ultimately, where in lies you play the Lakers, where in lie you play the Warriors. Um, if those two teams are in front of you at any point on the postseason schedule, if you're Portland, you're not happy. Um because those two teams are going to eliminate you time in and time out. And I still think that the Warriors are going to be widely disrespected this season. Um, going into it, they're 13th on the power rankings on NBC.com. Uh, I mean, I don't need to go any further and look to any other sources to tell you that's just wrong. I mean, that team has got championship pedigree pretty much up and down, and then they go and they steal Jameis Wiseman for the second pick. Come on, stop. You want to tell me that that team's not going to come out and do exactly what they did the year before last? Once they knew last season was lost, there was no point to win. I mean, I'm not saying that that's a championship organization right there to, you know, make sure that you get a good pick, but, I mean, come on. They knew that their their season was lost. That their guys were injured. Draymond Green did all he could. Draymond Green is one of the most underappreciated, undervalued guys in the league. And I realize with Clay Thompson out that that, you know, looks like it hinders their chances. But with guys like Kelly Oubre and Andrew Wiggins, and Kelly Oubre is, is a great defender, um, and he's another guy in the, as a three who could take a lot of stress. He kind of plays the Iguodala rule a little bit there. Um, Wiggins coming in as well. I mean, he gets a breath of fresh air with the championship organization, a championship medal. Steve Kerr is a coach. I'm just saying look out for the Warriors. The Warriors are the team right there that I think is is probably on the cusp of the Lakers' backside. I think that the Warriors are more of a threat to the Lakers overall than any other team in the West. All right, y'all. Now it's time for what we've all been waiting for, the Lakers. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, not all of us. But that's the pick to win the title, the Lakers. I mean, if you're looking past anything other than that, then you shouldn't be gambling your money. Um, if you want to get good odds on a team, that's a, an entirely different thing. If you want to try to maximize your potential payout, that's totally cool. I get it. And that's the, that's the lure of betting. But if you really look at it this season, the Lakers are the team that is going to win the championship. Um, and that brings me to kind of something that I alluded to earlier is the GOAT. Is LeBron James considered the GOAT if he wins his fifth NBA championship in his 11th NBA Finals appearance? I still say no. I still say no ultimately just because I feel like that going undefeated in all of your Finals appearances is something that we will probably never see again. Not, and I don't mean going 1-0 and or 2-0 and or 3-0. and I mean, going 3-0 and in the finals is impressive. But, I mean, guy, there's lots of guys that have won championships. Robert Ory's won championships, you know. Um, but if you, here's the thing that I, I will say. Now, it's hard for me to completely disregard LeBron James as potentially the greatest of all time. And here's the reason why. Because I grew up in the 90s basketball era. I was, I'm 37, and watching Michael Jordan play and take care of his business was something like I've never seen before. Because, you know, like his documentary pointed out, he took everything personally. And every matchup that he played, he got up for in an entirely different way than any other athlete did. But what separates Jordan and LeBron is the GM. The GM that Jordan had was Krause, who built a team around him that was buildable and sustainable in that era. Um, and then in this era, with all the athletes that are around LeBron James that he competes against day in and day out, he he took a Cavaliers team to the finals in his second season, and he went up against a Spurs team that everybody knew he had no business beating, so you have to give him a pass there. I mean, Jordan didn't go to his finals in his you know first 
second in his second season. You know, he he came and willed them back to the playoffs after the injury when the GM tried to do everything he could to get him to tank. Um, but ultimately, that's where I I separate you know the two is the, the the drive the you know the way that Jordan kept coming back and kept coming 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 and then all of a sudden he breaks through and he wins one and he wins two and then he wins three and then he gets so sick and tired of hearing everybody you know talk about him follow him everywhere and he gets driven out of basketball and then he comes back and he's like okay I want to win again one one two one three and you look up and you know he's been to the final six times and he won all six of them. LeBron, on the other hand, I mean, he's done it a different way. Going to Miami, um, I consider him losing those two championships with Miami to be checks against him. You know, it's great you went to four t- championships with that team, but if you remember his his lead in his intro, he with him and Wade and Bosh all sitting at the dais in their uniforms. You know, LeBron, you know, did the whole Greg Oden thing. He's like, not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, six, seven, eight eight championships because that's how Blazer fans were feeling when they drafted Greg Oden and paired him with Brandon Roy and LaMarcus Aldridge they're like minimum eight Pete yeah deal with this for the next decade too bad that never happened sorry Blazer fans to remind us of that but anyway the Lakers are clearly the best team and LeBron is probably going to win another championship this year and add to his legacy 11 championships though is incredible I don't care if you've lost you know a couple of them but going to 11 that's something that you know we probably will not see another athlete do in the NBA um, going forward. Eleven championships? I mean, unless it's like his son, um, you know, LeBron James Jr. when he comes in. But again, I mean, it's just going to get that rivalry and that discussion going more between Jordan and James fans. Um, where do you stand? Where do you lie? Which who do you think is the goat? If if LeBron wins another chip this year, does that enhance his goat status? Is he already your goat? Or is there no way, shape, or form, no matter what LeBron James does, you would ever consider him the GOAT over Michael Jordan? I know there are some of you out there that won't even consider LeBron James the GOAT over Kobe Bryant. That's an argument that I'm willing to listen to. I mean, Kobe doesn't have anything else to, to put out there to give us an example to go off of, but I think that that man did a lot of things that mimicked the way Michael Jordan did his. He, he went about his business the exact same way. He stayed at the franchise that he was traded to on draft night, and he never looked back. He, he took the purple and gold and, and ran with it, and he put five banners in the ceiling with you know three of them with Shaq and two of them without. So there's a debatable conversation to be had there, but feel free to share your comments. Um, moving on to the tonight's uh, games, um, but before I do that, before I move into tonight's games, I wanted to just celebrate the news for all the Northwestern uh, basketball fans, and specifically all those Seattle Supersonic fans. Exciting news from Adam Silver yesterday that the league is talking about expansion and that Seattle would be number one in line for potential destinations for an expansion team. That's such incredible news considering the rich basketball heritage that you know Seattle already possesses and was robbed of once of by you know. Uh, the, the guy from uh, Oklahoma City, Clay Bennett, excuse me, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm losing it off the top of my head. I tried to suppress it, excuse me. Um, but what, what an exciting day yesterday to get that news. Um, you know, you got the revamp key arena up there. Uh, you got the hockey team starting up. So the market is accelerated in a revamped way. And I think that the NBA, I, they're going to take a close look at analyzing what they say is competitive balance of the league, which is something fair I mean if you really think about competitive balance of the league how many teams do you realistically look at every season and say they have a chance to win the championship out of the 30 currently I would say eight I'd say you look every year and you look about eight teams and you say wow these guys probably are the the the, the good teams minus injuries they're probably easily going to be here in this spot at the end of the year barring an exciting matchup or an unforeseen elimination by a team that just gets hot you know, baseball used to be the ultimate sport to where, you know, there was only four teams that went back in the day out of like the 25 or 26 that they had in the league at the time. I mean, think about that. Only four teams went to your playoffs. I mean, you want to talk about the upper echelon of competition. Um, but the NBA has to look ultimately as do we have enough players in the world that we could bring in to keep everything competitive? And I think the answer is yes. I think that if you look at all the branding that they've done in all the European countries, um, South America, Central America, um, there's been a lot of development in a lot of different countries with a lot of great athletes that I think could fill a lot of rosters. And, you know, I, I think that in the future you're going to see uh, amateur athletes 
not go the NCAA route when the restrictions free up a little bit, you're going to see more development of talent. I mean, as we can just see, um, there's going to be a, a change in culture. There's going to be a change in how people decide their future, if they're going to go to college or whether or not they're going to try to go straight to the G League or straight to some type of pro developmental league. Uh, but the NBA is in a good spot with Seattle, and I think it's exciting news. Um, and I can't wait to see the rivalry revamped up with the Blazers again. Um, I'd be really interested uh, to be in attendance at that game, to be able to cover that game for everybody, because that would just be dear to my heart. It was, it was hard to watch uh, the Sonics be relocated as a Blazers fan, even just because, you know, it sustained the Northwest and it sustained spotlight. Um, it just left Blazers fans kind of felt feeling, I guess, alone out here, um, just tucked up here near Alaska with no exposure. Uh, so hopefully the, the, mar the basketball market up in Seattle gets that exposure that's necessary. Um, so now after celebrating the return of the Seattle Sonics, um, feel free to share your comments in the bottom, guys, about how you feel about the Sonics coming back. Uh, when do you think it'll happen? If you have a prediction, what year? 2022? 2023? Who owns the team? Any potential guesses? Chris Hansen, perhaps? Outside investor? Someone we haven't thought about? Maybe Jamal Crawford, perhaps? Russell Wilson? I'd be willing to put my money on Russell Wilson being a potential um, majority stake owner in the Sonics moving forward. Chris Hansen already tried it and the city and everybody tried to do everything they could to derail it from happening, which is unfortunate that you have a guy who has all that drive and passion to bring a product to you and is willing to spend all that money blindly to bring it to you and then psh, it doesn't happen. But I still think that Russell Wilson would be the leading face, him and his wife Sierra, um, because they've already talked about even potentially owning the Seahawks one day. So there's no reason to say that Russell Wilson doesn't have like a monopoly um, when it comes to the, the board pieces. If the board pieces were the Seahawks and the Sonics and then the hockey team, who knows? I don't know if he owns any of that, but you know, you get what I'm saying. I think he wants to own a baseball team down in Portland as well, opening up that thing. So Russell Wilson could be the all Northwest, you know, entrepreneur. Um, so for tonight's games, got some exciting games actually. You got Golden State coming back, um, seven and a half point underdogs against the Brooklyn Nets with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Um, gosh, I just don't think that the, uh, the the Warriors are getting the respect that they deserve. Seven and a half points, in in my opinion, is is disrespectful, especially for a team that's won multiple championships and has multiple championship pieces still in its lineup with uh, Steph Curry coming back and Draymond Green, and then they added Kelly Oubre Jr. and then they've also uh, got Andrew Wiggins as well, and then they got Jameis Wiseman, the new second round or second overall pick from the draft that just happens to land in their face. Um, yeah, take the Warriors tonight. Uh, so if you're if you're trying to get an idea about what it is I'm talking about, then the Brooklyn Nets are seven and a half point favorites. That means that um, they would need to win the game by eight or more points for you to successfully win your bet. Um, and then if you wanted to put it on the money line, that means you just want to play them to win the game straight up. You don't even want to worry about the points, which is an easier bet for the favorite. You put 100 down and you uh, risk a minus $330 um, percentage of your, min your money. So essentially you get $30 back uh, for putting $100 out there. So you uh, risk 100 to win about 30 bucks. The other side of it is this. If you're uh, an underdog, you're uh, trying to win within a certain amount of points and the Warriors are getting seven and a half points. Um, which means that, yeah, so I would take the Warriors in a heartbeat. Uh, if you play the money line, which isn't a bad idea, by the way, um, put $100 to win $270 back on your money on the Warriors tonight. I just think it's going to take a little bit of time for the Nets to get going, to gel. Um, I don't know if they're going to be out of the East by the time it's all said and done. I think the Celtics are coming out of the East this year. I like the, I like the Lakers over the Celtics in six. Um, but the Nets are going to be there at the end, along with the Bucks, with uh, Drew Holiday getting added to the Bucks. I think that's a great pairing to go with Giannis, uh, something that he can play off of and doesn't need to touch the ball because Giannis is a guy who shouldn't command the ball. He should come off of screens, get good position down low, and get out in transition and get easy buckets. Um, the Bucks are going to be a, a problem, but I like that the uh, I like the Celtics and I, I like Jason Tatum and and Jalen Brown. Those two guys are young and exciting and can put the ball in the bucket. And Kemba Walker is you know plus five. Um, in per 100 possessions for when he's on the floor for him. So he's just a guy who's going to put his guys in great position. Um, on to the next game real quick. Sorry to interrupt that little Eastern Conference talk there. Last game of the night is the Clippers and the Lakers. Los Angeles Lakers are going to come in um, defending their championship on opening night on TNT at 7 o'clock tip-off time tonight. Two and a half point favorites with an over under of 219 and a half. I love the over on that one, by the way. Tired legs, easy buckets all around. Minus two and a half on the money or on the spread. Uh, one, minus 145 on the money line. 
Um, again, love the Lakers here tonight, minus two and a half. Um, the Clippers lost their sixth man of the year, Montrez Harrell, who goes to the Lakers. So uh, the Lakers also add Dennis Schroeder to the mix, another guy who could score, uh, take some pressure off of LeBron and Anthony Davis. Um, I just ultimately feel like the Lakers are going to get a win tonight. Just to, That's just kind of the way it works when you open up a season after winning a championship. The guys come out and win your game. Um, if, if Kawhi or, you know, regular season Paul George has the Clippers in a position to, you know, make it close at the end, um, you know, probably miss a shot late and then get a rebound and foul a guy and then you're looking at a cover here. So I like the Lakers uh, to cover tonight and I also like the Lakers uh, ultimately to win again the title this season. Um, my top four teams in the West would be in no particular order. Well, I'll, you, I'll, I'll try to go particular order. In particular order, I would say the Lakers obviously number one. Number two, I would go with the Warriors. And then number three, I would go with probably the Nuggets. And then four, the Clippers. Those would be my top four teams with, I mean, on, on the verge, the, the Mavericks and the Blazers. Um, I like where they're kind of at on the verge. The Jazz also there. Um, I, I'm picking the, you know, the Blazers behind the Jazz technically, so I should probably have the Jazz uh, right above them. Uh, and then the Eastern Conference, my, my top four teams would be the Celtics and then the Bucks. Uh, and then the Heat uh, and the Raptors. Well, actually, I'm going to substitute the the Raptors for the Nets. Um, I think the Raptors are, are have been in a in a tough position. They just they're getting great coaching. They're just they're just this piece of fruit that just has so much juice in it that you just can't possibly squeeze it all out for some reason. And Siakam has been a a tremendous tremendous player. He's just gotten better and better and better every year. He's a bona fide virgin superstar. Um, Siakam is whether you believe that or not it's he's a player um, so it's gonna be actually a little bit more interesting I think in the Eastern Conference but once you get past six or seven there's nothing to talk about still and that's the depressing part is once you get past six or seven there's just nothing there so anyway guys in summary um, thanks for tuning in to the uh, to the show today um, got the uh, Blazers opening tomorrow against the Utah Jazz uh, that'll be an exciting game. We'll see how, I think the Blazers come out and probably get a victory in, in game one, but I'm just interested to see how the rotation works um, early on. And uh, again, I'm just interested to see if they're going to go ahead and make a move uh, going forward. Um, and then we'll see what we get after tonight's games. Maybe I can get online. We can do a little recap. Um, again, post your comments in the bottom. Thanks for tuning in. Like and share guys, like and subscribe um, at the bottom. We'll be doing this um, more often for you guys. So thanks for tuning in. Have a good night.